We're out for the day in modern Strasbourg. Cosmopolitan, chic, expensive. It is difficult to envisage what it must have been like in the 16th century. How can we build up a picture for ourselves of the Germanic city-state of Strasbourg, when modern-day French Strasbourg dominates the landscape? Wandering through Petit France reading the guidebook, we are told that this is old Strasbourg. But do these smart black and white buildings truly conjure up that crowded, often squalid, and certainly smelly quarter of 16th century Strasbourg. Just looking at the city will not reconstruct that world for us. We shall need to use all the resources available to try to reconstruct the 16th century city. Physical remains of the city, woodcuts, maps, and engravings. If we are lucky, a guidebook might include a contemporary view of old Strasbourg. This is a woodcut made in the late 15th century, but it doesn't really tell you much about the city. There's not much detail. The cathedral dominates. It looks impressive. But it looks like a thousand other images of Germanic cities of the time. And we certainly couldn't find our way about this city using it. We need a much more detailed image if we are to reconstruct the structure of Strasbourg. Fortunately, we have one to hand. Conrad Morant painted this pictorial map of the city in 1548. It is a strange affair, full of idiosyncrasies, which we have to be aware of if we are to use it properly. Morant created his map from a vantage point on the cathedral tower, 142 meters high. He painted what he could see, and all we can see of the cathedral is the roof of the nave. From this angle, it's hard to see the facades of the buildings facing the cathedral. And this is how he showed them. This meant that the relationship between different parts of the city are skewed. But we can understand why when we realize that he was turning the paper round as he turned to face what he was painting. This was how he attempted his 360 degree perspective. Other inconsistencies were not purely perspectival. His own world view dictated which buildings he emphasized and which not. The city was Protestant and so Morant emphasized the temple. This was the former Dominican monastery recently converted to Lutheran worship. And everyone living in Strasbourg was well aware of the significance of the ring of walls which protected the city. So Morant went around the periphery of his map, putting the walls in, the other way up if necessary, to make sure they were clearly visible. Most of the walls date from the 13th century and provide one of the most elaborate and effective systems of the medieval period. This is what remains of the towers of the covered bridges, where the river Eel enters the city. The new method of defence was the bastion. Low, heart-shaped projections allowed defensive artillery to sweep the area in front of the walls and neutralise any offensive manoeuvre. It was a ruthless and exacting theory which isolated cities from their surrounding countryside. These illustrations are from the treatise of Daniel Specklin, the city architect of Strasbourg. Specklin's actual improvements, however, were rather piecemeal. Below the towers, he installed these gun emplacements low down over the river, where defensive cannon could rake approaching ships. But the heart of the city is concentrated around the cathedral. Today, when we look at the buildings here, however ancient, we see them as isolated relics of the past, pieces in a museum which do not add up to 16th century Strasbourg. Let us try to find out what this area was like then. Morant shows it as a spacious religious and civic city centre. The cathedral in 1548, from which Morant worked, was used for Catholic worship 
although the Protestants reclaimed it for worship in 1561. It was looked on as the mother church of Alsatian Protestantism. Right here, outside the cathedral, the citizenry swore their allegiance to the city each year. Crossing the cathedral square and passing through the commercial centre, we find the St. Martin Platz and a further group of public buildings. In the middle is the 14th century Faltz. It served as a town hall where the magistrates assembled. Behind it is the chancellery. Tipped up to reveal its facade is the new mint. And having its own mint was an important sign of civic independence. Sometime after this map was drawn, a space at the top of the square was cleared to build the Neubau, literally the new building. Today it appears significant as a symbol of 16th century Strasbourg's growing aspirations as a major European city. It is one of the first examples of sophisticated Renaissance architecture in Strasbourg. Built in the 1580s as an extension to the chancellery, it provided the municipal rooms above and commercial space below. These arches were originally open and gave on to a vaulted space used by merchants. The style of the building follows Italianate Renaissance principles with superimposed classical orders. But much of the detail is of the same German Mannerist kind which the architect Wendel Dieterlin would publish in his book Architectura in Strasbourg in 1593. But in Marant's time, this was still in the future. Central Strasbourg was still medieval and relatively small in scale. Yet for its time, it was notable for the size and design of the houses of the rich. Substantial houses fronting on the street often possessed a leafy court and one or even two buildings to the rear for storage or occupation by poorer persons. The touristy shops of today have taken the place of a different order of commerce. Small shops clustered against the walls of the cathedral. In Marant's day, fish was sold off the stone slabs in the St. Martin Platz. The magistrates in the Faults complained bitterly of the smells. Today's fashionable arcades of boutiques preserved the physical structure of late medieval shops, but not the workshops which occupied the space. We can see similar arcades around the corn market. The wide streets and market spaces must have bustled with Strasburgers buying and selling food and other commodities. The area around the cathedral was used by traders. Freshly baked bread was sold here. And this is where the market gardeners sold their vegetables. And behind, near the river, is the wood market. Who, on a visit to Strasbourg, is not attracted to the Camazelle? It's covered in rich decoration and is very striking. Eating in the restaurant will be a gourmet experience but will not of itself further your understanding of its place in Strasbourg's past. But this house was part of the house of a cheese merchant. Martin Brown began by buying a small single-storey stone house, already over a hundred years old, in 1571. Brown made his fortune and used it to build upwards and outwards in wood on this relatively restricted site. His enlarged house would express his newfound status. Brown wanted the upper floors to overhang by 10 feet, but a municipal ruling of 1588 restricted them to 5 feet. But Brown did not only express his status through the size of the building, he used a very elaborate decorative scheme. The iconography is complex, but unexceptional. Here on the corner, we see faith, hope and charity. He had portrayed the five senses. 
Here is smell and taste and hearing. Among the historical personalities shown are Charlemagne, Carolus Magnus and Julius Caesar. Significantly, this house was bought and restored in the late 19th century by the municipality after Strasbourg had been reclaimed by Germany as a symbol of the city's Germanic aspirations. If much of Strasbourg's wealth ended up in the old centre, there can be little doubt that it entered the city via the river. This is the customs house where incoming goods were subject to a levy. It's hard looking at the river area today to visualise what it must have been like. Huge quantities of grain, wine, cloth and other commodities entered the city through the port. In Wenceslas Holler's engraving, you can see the cranes which had been in use from about 1380. Huge numbers of people worked here, merchants, boatmen and navvies. Trade attracted wealthy merchants like Leonard Cow, who built a house on this site. This expensive stone building dates from 1583 and it has the newly fashionable oriel windows. Beneath it we can see the arches which might have housed workshops for rental. The date and the monogram of the owner reveal the new confidence of the affluent merchant class. But not everyone who lived on the river was of cow's class. This is the boatman's quarter. If we penetrate the outer skin of the building, we enter a small common courtyard surrounded by tenements. In these would have crowded the boatmen's families of the time. An 18th century model shows how the spine of the city was the curving road now known as the Grande Rue. It was the fashionable street, adorned with the houses of the rich burghers and patricians, merchants and bankers. Typical of the large houses of wealthy merchants and bankers in the city is this house. The Ameister Daniel Moog lived here in 1526, although the front of the building seems to have been rebuilt by his son-in-law, Jakob Ingold, of the famous banking family. The practical and working character of this property comes over clearly in the interior court, which is adapted to the storage of merchandise. Even now, you can see the derrick used to hoist goods up into the spacious multi-storey attics which all these large houses had. Away from the main street, these buildings are detailed in a simple but effective manner. All householders of Strasbourg were legally required to store food in case of emergencies. Many of these multi-storey attics in the roof spaces survive today. The Place Saint-Étienne gives us a good mix of commercial and noble properties. These houses, for example, have the stone arches on the ground floor which were used for shops with dwellings above. Across the square, however, we find a much grander property built on the site of an old chapel. A number of noble families lived here, including the Berstedt, the Zuckmantel, and Dietrich Böcklin von Böcklinsau, who rebuilt it in 1598. Here again, we find stone orioles and fine carved detail. On the first floor is a splendid hall with classical detailing. This was an appropriate setting for feasts and banquets. A further examination of Morant displays another structuring of the social space of the city. The contrast between a rich centre and a poorer periphery. As a general rule, the housing grows more modest and smaller the further one travels from the centre. The network of streets, narrower and more winding. The houses have fewer floors. On the fringes of the city, the prevalence of market gardening is shown. The lone cottages of those of modest means 
appear scattered in the fields. An engraving of 1576 by the Swiss engraver Tobias Stimmer shows us a cross-section of Strasbourg society as it liked to present itself. The occasion was an international crossbow contest and contingents came from all over Germany and Switzerland. Playing host to the visitors were the more influential guilds whose tents can be seen splendidly arrayed around the shooting area. Here are the tailors, one of the 20 guilds which participated directly in the government of the city. Guilds, or tribes, had an administrative or social centre known as a stuba, or stove, where members gathered around the stove for formal meeting, for a drink or a feast. We can conjure up something of these convivial events from the present-day Stammtisch, where Alsatian-speaking men gather regularly in stuba or inns. A guild often turned itself into a confraternity, which aided its poor members. The barbers, for example, built the Grand Hospital in 1477. This was one of the largest hospitals in Germany and was owned by the city. The pharmacy, dated 1572, still survives. Much important work was carried out at Strasbourg, where medicine was held in very high regard. The hospital, on the right, was rebuilt on the same foundations after a fire in 1716. It was one of the largest landowners in the area, and these cellars store the wine from its vineyards. Some casks date from the 15th century, and one still contains a 1472 vintage. The relationship between craft, skills, money and political power emerges clearly from the massive undertaking of the cathedral itself. By the time the stonecutters and masons had reached the west facade, that is from around 1300, their administration had been taken over by the city government, being too important and expensive to be left to the cathedral itself. Thus the Cathedral Office of Works now known as the Oeuvre de Notre Dame, lost its purely practical character and became a prestigious municipal meeting house and office. This wing was added in 1578 to 1582. In addition to the administration of the cathedral works, this building also housed the Lodge of Masons. Such was the prestige of Strasbourg Cathedral and its craftsmen that from 1459 the chief mason on this site was given the privilege of Grand Master of the German Lodges in perpetuity. Thomas Ulberger, who designed this new wing, supplied demonstration pieces of stone carving virtuosity. He combined classical columns, mannerist detail and Gothic vaulting. The only common denominator was complexity. Each of the men who served on the Lodge Council recorded their own marks in painted panels like this one, which actually dates from the 17th century. Linking the old and new wings, Ulberger designed a monumental staircase. Ulberger's staircase can be literally thought of as a masterpiece of the kind the apprentices had to make before being accepted into the profession. For a late 16th century work, it's both conservative in its traditional Gothic form and up to date in its details. Building up to a quite astonishing climax at the top, this work both advocates the maintenance of the medieval traditions of the cathedral masons and asserts the economic power of the city. On a visit to Strasbourg, we inevitably find ourselves in the area known as Petit France. The name of the canal which runs through this area, the Tanner's Ditch, is more descriptive of the ancient nature of the quarter. The road over the filled-in ditch today gives us no clue to its original condition. 
but 19th century lithographs give us a glimpse of the tightly packed houses of this once industrial quarter, bordering on the fetid canal. The outlet of the covered ditch can still be seen, but the character of the area has utterly changed. 19th century views show that there were tanneries here at the time, but were there in the 16th century? Well, looking about us, we can see some evidence of the tanneries. The louvered roofs provided an area where the hides were dried out. Water from the canal was essential to the industry. But these houses may have been tanneries once, but their altered and restored condition makes them untrustworthy as evidence. This building, for example, labelled for the tourist trade Maison des Tanneurs, is dated 1572. But was it a tanner's house? And how original is the building? In places, we can recognise the sturdy craftsmanship of the 16th century carpenters, with braces cut into the wall plates. But the building has been enlarged and altered over the years. The galleries facing the river were added in the 19th century, and the whole building has adapted well to its present use as a restaurant. As for the ventilation louvers, they indicate use as a tannery, but probably not in the 16th century. Reconstructing individual buildings is both interesting and important, but the historian is left with certain problems about Petit France. In the 19th and even 18th century, tanneries abounded. The tanneries quarter, built perhaps on a small but important nucleus of the industry, established since the Middle Ages. 16th century Strasbourgers might have associated this quarter as much with bathhouses, brothels and feasting as with tanning. Unfortunately, none of these survive physically, but we know of them from contemporary woodcuts and written evidence. The bathhouses drew rich and poor, educated and uneducated, ecclesiastical and lay. It is evidence such as this which helps us to see how life was lived in this 16th century city, a life which found time for vice and victuals, as well as for worship and the making of wealth. Our sources show that the mill area, today a tourist attraction, had for the poor few picturesque associations. This woman throwing her young baby over the mill to its certain death was apparently one of the many driven to such action by the hardships of the city's life. Strasbourg today is not old Strasbourg and it is impossible to reconstruct the past from the present by simply walking around the city. Too much has changed. What we can do is use the rich variety of sources available to produce an image of the old city and to describe who lived there and how.